Good evening from Vietnam. Good morning, Professor Gerard Puccio. Thank you very much for spending your morning joining our Inside Sharing Show and share your stories with our global audience. And now on behalf of the listeners around the world, I want to say thank you for your generosity. Well, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. I always enjoy the opportunity to share my passion for the field of creativity. There's so many misunderstandings in terms of what creativity is. The first thing that comes to most people's mind is, oh, I'm not creative because I'm not an artist. And of course, we're really talking about imagination, which is necessary in the arts, but in every field, in every endeavor. So uh, whenever I have the opportunity to, to share that, um, that perspective and what I find is so profoundly important, I always enjoy um, the, the time to do that. So thanks for making this happen. Wow. And and Professor Puccio, our show is designed to bring you back in time for, for our audience to understand the journey that takes you into the field of curiosity and spend decades of your time in research and works on that. Uh, and since you haven't been to my country, but your colleagues been here, we would love to, to invite you to our country when you have ch a chance. You have a new friend, a new family here, and we'd love to take you around our beautiful city here, okay? <laughs> well, I appreciate that invitation. I've been to 40 some countries around the world and um, having done my studies overseas in, in England and had the chance to live outside of the U.S. I love cross-cultural experiences in Vietnam. I would love to add to the list of places that I've visited. So that's a kind of offer. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it also. Who knows who listen to the, the shows and maybe one of the clients of mine will be, you know, extended the care and invite you to, to visit this country. Who knows, right? <laughs> I would love to see that. I, me too. Yeah. And for the little taste of our culture, Professor Puccio, it is an honor for our audience to have you to share a little bit about who you are and the works that you are doing at the moment for them to know. Can you do that for us, please? Of course, huh? thanks. So um, let me revisit very quickly the concept of creativity I mentioned earlier. Um, it is fundamental to success in life and it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. This is why I've been at Buffalo State University for 33 years now studying creativity. Um, so let's be clear about what it is. Creativity is the highest order of thinking that humans can achieve. To create is to fill a void with something new and valuable. So it's using your imagination to create something that serves a purpose for you, for your family, for an organization, for a community, or all of society. So it's, it's, it's the highest level of thinking. We go to school, we go to university, we spend all, these time, all this time in education, but very little of our education focuses on really teaching us how to think. Mm. Often education is about taking in information and studying others, studying facts, uh, retaining content, but little very little time is spent on how we can be better thinkers. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the highest level of human thought is to be able to use our imagination to respond to challenges, to open-ended situations with useful, original responses, useful, original solutions. So that's just to give a little background because I don't want people scratching their heads and saying, well, why should I listen to this guy who's talking about creativity? I'm not an artist, I'm not a musician. It's not about that. Those are expressions of creativity, but we apply our imagination in all fields, all endeavors. And when you look at the most successful people in the world, when you look at successful leaders, you look at who becomes a successful entrepreneur, who becomes an executive, who becomes a famous writer, who's an effective school teacher, any field, the most successful people are those who are able to use their imagination to resolve complex problems because at the end of the day we all solve problems to live is to have problems mm. and when you solve problems creatively when there's something that stands between you and success that's a problem we use our minds to navigate that gap and so what what i do what my center center for applied imagination does 
is it helps to give people their creativity back, give their imagination and curiosity back to them because so much of life beats us down, right? Beats our beats the imagination out of us. Mm. Um, in school, when we approach the, the right answer and we're taught there's one way to do things that, that beats our creativity down. When we go to work and we're rewarded for repetition and efficiency and not new thinking, it beats our imagination down. So all humans have this capacity to think in new, imaginative, curious ways, but life is kind of challenging and it can be rough and and it can cause us to withdraw our imagination. But when you look at World Economic Forum, when you look at IBM report from a number of years back, uh, when you look at LinkedIn, all of these resources point out that creativity is considered to be one of the top skills in the 21st century hmm. because we live in a time of, of uncertainty and volatility and change comes so quickly, especially driven by technology. Look at artificial intelligence. It came seemingly out of nowhere and it has grown exponentially and will continue to do so in the degree to which it will fundamentally change our lives is just across the horizon. So in a world with uh, changes in the form of technology that fundamentally change how we live our lives, uh, creativity and being flexible and remaining open-minded and being curious is a fundamental workplace skill. I'll give you a statistic. Uh, technology goes through fundamental redesign in every six to 12 months. Now, go back two million years ago. And you think about the beginning of the human species. You go back two million years ago and the first stone tools lasted like a million years. Wow. Imagine a tool. Imagine buying a phone and thinking, oh, I'll have this a million years from now, right? We buy a phone and immediately we think it's out of date, right? So that's the world we live in. U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says someone who's 18 years of age today will change jobs at least nine times before they reach the age of 45. That's the world we live in today. So it's defined, defined by a lovely acronym, VUCA. We live in a VUCA world, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And that's why I'm passionate about the work that I do. Like never before, creativity and imagination and curiosity and being open-minded and being flexible are all considered essential workplace skills. More and more employers are saying, we can teach content but the shelf life of content is so short. People have to continuously upskill themselves and be flexible enough to adjust to an environment that's changing, changing rapidly, right? So creativity, I just said it, is an evolutionary skill. It's our competitive advantage. It allows us to adapt quickly to new environments. And that's the focus of my work. So I didn't share yet with you your a response to your question, how did I get into this work that I'm doing? But I first wanted to make sure people understood, well, what is this creativity stuff? What, why should I listen? Why is this important? Hmm. And frankly, I'll, I'll say one more thing. Uh, J.P. Guilford, a famous psychologist here in the U.S. who was a pioneer in the field of creativity, said that to live is to have problems. And to solve problems creatively leads to growth. So my contention is, yes, the World Economic Forum is correct. LinkedIn is correct. Many other um, business thought leaders are correct. Creativity is an essential workplace skill, but I'd like to broaden it beyond that and say it's a life skill. It's a life skill because life throws you challenges. Mm. And how successfully you think through those challenges, how successfully you respond to those challenges using your creative thinking will determine your success in life. And we know now that it's very much tied to happiness. It's tied to satisfaction. It's tied to well-being because the more skillful you are in responding to life's challenges, the better you are in terms of your mental well-being. Mm -hmm. so, so that's a very 
<laughs> you can see I get excited about my work, right? I get really wrapped up in, in talking about creativity, and I wanted to make sure that, first of all, your listeners um, understand this subject because very few universities teach it. Uh, it's still very much a niche area, but it's, it's, it's just fundamentally important to success in life. Like you say that uh, um, creativity is a life skill and it's unfortunate for a lot of us that we don't have that skill master, right? And thanks a lot for people like you pioneering the way for us to get back our creativity, our imagination, our curiosity. So mm -hmm. this talk is designed to bring you back into the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, of how it's mm -hmm. done. And uh, would you want to travel time with me, Professor Puccio? <laughs> sure, of course. Take me on a, on a time, time war, please. Yep. When I was very little, I wanted to become an astronaut and wearing the astronaut suit and jumping in different planets seems very cool, but life didn't give me any chance to do anything close to what I wanted to, 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 to do. So I wonder, and many of my listeners would like to know, when you were young, were a little boy, what was your dream about your future self though? Wow, you're really taking me far, far back. Uh, that was a long time ago. So I grew up in a small town uh, in, in Pennsylvania, um, one of the states, northeast states in the U.S., a uh, very small town, um, an agricultural town, a um, lot, of, lot of great farms there. And, you know, honestly, I had a lot of dreams, of course, like a lot of small boys do, uh, professional athletes, um, was probably uh, high on my list uh, in terms of, um, you know, fantasizing about a future. Uh, but as I got older, I have to admit that uh, growing up in a small town, uh, I, I thought I would always be in that small town. Um, and, and when I went away to university, which I went away to be an athlete, I stumbled onto this field of creativity. I had an academic advisor who taught a course in creativity, and he said to me, you know, I really think you would enjoy this course. Um, and so I took my first course in creativity back in 1981 at a community college. I was there to be on the wrestling team, and it just, it, it, it transformed me. It transformed me, and that, you know, often, when people get really committed to and passionate about something, it's because they have had a personal experience. And I had a personal experience because I grew up in a small town and I moved away to go to a community college to pursue athletics. And then suddenly I became intellectually alive. Oh. And, and as a result of studying creativity and, and, and when we start to study creativity, we really are studying ourselves, right? Because, the source of creativity is the individual. And so I grew immensely in my confidence. I grew immensely in terms of my um, outlook on life and my imagination in terms of what I could do. So what's, what's funny, ha, 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 what's funny <laughs> is that I, you know, you talk about dreams of being an astronaut and so forth. And yes, I had the traditional, I want to grow up and be a football player or famous baseball player. But when I took this first course in creativity, that's when I would say I had really the first grounded vision of what I could be in my life, a much larger than I imagined that I could be, that I, I, I fell in love with the idea of being a writer, and now I'm a writer. Oh. I fell in love with the idea of studying in a field and making a contribution and being a thought leader, and, and I am. Um, so it was really that first course in creativity where I learned how to be a creative problem solver. I learned to fuel my imagination and to see a world of possibilities and opportunities then rather than limitations and barriers it was really at the age of like 18 19 years old that i thought 
wow, I can, I can, I can be more, I can do more. Mm. Um, you know, I had this internal locus of control. I had this gift of imagination and, and it was that personal transformation that I went through, um, that really, um, and it really was the gift of creativity. Honestly, it was getting in connection with my own, my own creativity that that made all the difference. Wow! So it's all it's all happened because of one advisor recommended you to take a, a, a just creativity. chance, just ah. luck. It was just luck. Um, yeah, yeah. It actually, was it came out of frustration too. I had my first year of university. I went to a local university very close to the small town that I grew up in, and I was commuting. Hmm. And it was okay. I was having a good experience. I was studying psychology, um, but I was missing something. I wanted to. So I guess it was that yearning to um, break down some of if one of the definitions of creativity that I like is the ability to overcome self-imposed constraints. The hmm. ability to overcome self-imposed constraints. So we often, you know, I was talking earlier about how life and experiences and our environment, school and work can mm. limit our creativity. Um, I want to back up a little bit and say we are responsible for our own creativity and our own imagination. So we, yes, are impacted by our social environment, but we also limit because of self-imposed constraints. We limit ourselves in terms of how much we use our creativity. So. Uh, a self-imposed constraint that I had was you know, everybody around me is going to the local university. So I went to the local university. I was commuting. I was doing what most everyone else from my graduating high school class, what they were doing. And yet somehow I was not fully satisfied. Mm. And so I had to break that barrier of leaving my small town. I had to get outside of my comfort zone. Mm. Right. So you don't grow unless you get outside of your comfort zone and you expose yourself to new things, which is a fundamental characteristic of creativity is being open to new experiences. And so after that year, that first year, when something somehow was not satisfying for me, hmm. I had to challenge my own self-imposed constraint that I would live forever in the small town and find a way to get a career there and so forth. But when I broke that barrier, you know, so yes, it was chance. Yes, it was luck that I met this academic advisor and he happened to teach creativity, but I had to make a decision first, mm. which was to change, bring change into my life, right? Mm -hmm. And go away to, to college. And so that decision opened up, you know, opened up this new opportunity. Wow. And, I, and I will say every, honestly, every, you know, in life, we come to these key decisions that the metaphor of the fork in the road where you can choose the path to the left or the path to the right. Every major decision I have made since then has always moved me in the continuous direction of uh, furthering my study of creativity and my own development as a as a creative person. So, you know, yeah. Now, today, many years later, um, a distinguished professor, I'm an author, I'm a department chair, I'm a longtime faculty member, but beyond that, I'm also a consultant, I'm a speaker, I run a, a small business, um, Foresight, I'm a partner with a lovely team of individuals, professionals who have commercialized a tool that I've developed called Foresight, which measures people's preferences within the creative process. So one way to give people's creativity back is to help them to identify how it's already inside of them. Oh. And so this psychological tool identifies people's preferences for four areas within the creative process. And everyone has um, creativity already inside of them. And when you look at fundamentally the creative process, what does it, what does it involve? It involves clarifying, okay, what's the problem I need to address? What's the current reality? Do I understand that? Do I understand the root causes to the problem? Then there's ideation. Okay, so what do I do about this? What can I imagine as new possibilities? The third is taking the best ideas 
that come from your imagination and refining them into workable solutions and making sure that they fit the situation, that they have uh, true potential, and then it's putting things into action, it's implementing. And so for short, we call these clarifiers, ideators, developers, and implementers. And we, what we know from psychology is that people have different degrees of energy mm. for those four areas. And it also tells us about their personality. So clarifiers are different than ideators. And they're different from developers than they are from, from implementers. So uh, this has been commercialized. So I, I, I have four partners that I've worked with. Um, there have been several hundred thousand people who've completed this measure. It's available in, in seven different languages. And it's, it's really um, extremely a powerful tool to help people understand their own creativity, but also teams because we work in teams and we collaborate with people. Mm. This is another kind of diversity. I might be someone who really is comfortable with high ideating, who's working with someone who really prefers clarifying that can lead to tension oh. because our personalities are so different. The high ideator is the dreamer and thinking about the future and their imagination is always, you know, thinking about possibilities. Whereas the clarifying type person is, hold on, let's look at the situation carefully. Let's make sure we understand all the information in front of us, um, much more grounded in reality. So the psychological tool helps people to understand these differences because it promotes more effective collaboration. Mm. Um, so, so what I'm saying is, yes, I'm an entrepreneur as well. Um, I have an Airbnb that I run. Um, so I, I have very much a, a creative life now because of the training that I've gone through. 42 years ago, 1981. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Before we talk about the 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 four sides and and I, I want to bring you back onto that 1981. A lot of us mm -hmm. has that aha moment, the Eureka moments in life, right? And then mm -hmm. and then we just had that moment sparkle a little bit and then it's gone. Then I want to bring you back to that class, the first time that you took the creativity class, and what triggered inside of your head back then that that makes you devote the rest of your years up until now be in the field of creativity and help people to gain back creativity themselves. Huh? Well, huh, thanks, thanks. Um, wow, it, 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 I must say uh, it brings back a lot of pleasant memories. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for bringing me back in, in time um, and asking really good questions. Um, so what did I experience? Um, I experienced what it was like to discover things about myself mm -hmm. and that um, there's a, a lecture that I do with um, the, the final course and the sequence of graduate classes in our master's degree program in creativity and change leadership. Um, in the seminar on creativity and change leadership, we talk about power. Mm -hmm. And we discuss personal power because leadership is about how you influence others. It's not about your title. You know, you can have someone who has the title of boss, but they're a terrible leader because they're not positively influencing others. You can have someone who has the title of manager, but that's not necessarily being a leader. It's what you do. It's how you influence others. And so in this lecture, um, I talk to my students about how we can lose our power, how we how we give up our power um, by negative self-talk, for example, or by um, credentializing, believing that we don't have the right credentials uh, to be able to to do something. Um, so to tie that back to your question, what was it when? I was 18, 19 years old. What was it about this creativity course? It connected me to um, the power inside of myself mm. that I had the power to solve my own problems. I had the power to make choices and to create alternatives in my life. 
Um, I mean, very simple creativity principle. When you're faced with a, with a problem, you don't go with your first answer. Your first answer may not be the best direction to go in. Always ask yourself, what else might I do? What else might I do? Mm. What are my alternatives? And that was a powerful insight for me. You know, sometimes we, we go through life just sort of reacting rather than being proactive. And I guess one of the things that uh, I realized at the age of 18 or 19 was to truly be awake mm. and understand that I could navigate and direct my own life. And I, I had choices and I could create alternatives for myself. And, and that's very powerful. So I, I, I would say, you know, what made me commit to, or what, what was it that made that first course in creativity so powerful for me hmm. was that it, it connected me to the power inside of myself. Were you actively seeking for, for that, you know, that tool before, before that day that you joined the class? No, are you kidding? I had never even heard of creativity. I didn't even know it was a thing. Uh, I thought, like many people, that creativity was for artists. I didn't think of it as a thought process or a skill set or something that I could develop. Hmm. And, and, you know, honestly, now it, it has impacted every aspect of my life, including parenting and raising my children. You know, when you have children and, you know, You, nothing prepares you for being a parent, really. It's it's on the job training, right? You're you're learning as you're going. But I will say my skills in, in solving problems creatively and my skills as a facilitator help me to to be a parent. I'll, I'll share a story with you because mm. I know your your listeners like stories. So I have two boys, uh, Gabriel and Anthony, and I remember we were having dinner. One time, uh, Gabriel was probably like 10, 11 years old, so his brother was probably like seven or eight. And he says to me, while we're having dinner, he announces, get this, he says to me, you know, Dad, he's very thoughtful. He's, he's, he's got a big brain. He's a very thoughtful person, very soulful. He says to me, you know what, Dad? I've been thinking, you're not like other fathers. Well, what do you mean I'm not like other fathers? And he said, well, that, that, you just asked me a question. You ask lots of questions. I don't see other fathers doing that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is interesting. So Gabe, tell me how else am I like, not like other fathers? And he said, well, you know, when I'm fighting with my brother, Anthony, you'll say things like, how else might you solve this problem? And I, oh, I have to say, it like blew me away because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm using creative facilitation with my children. I didn't even know it. So that's a, that's a strategy, questioning strategy, turning a challenge, you know, into an open-ended question to explore other ways. Okay, so yes, you could fight each other, but what else might you do? How else might you solve all this problem is a creative question. I didn't even know I was doing that as a parent. And here you have a 10, 11 year old reflecting that back to me. I share that story with you because it, it highlighted for me and I didn't realize this. It was like looking in the mirror. I didn't realize how much of my training I was adopting into my parenting. So mm. I, I shared that story just to, to highlight the universal uh, application of, of creativity and creative problem solving and facilitation skills uh, across all aspects of our lives, not just our work lives, but our personal lives as well. Like you say earlier, it's a life skill, right? So it's, you bathe with that mindset, you've been, you know, breathing with that creativity, philosophy and, 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 and practicing tools also yourself every day. So you don't realize it, but, but Gabrielle was so very smart to, to spot it out and, and let you know that, you know, there's a lot of time that, you know, we learn from our children also, and, and, and that That's boosts true. our creativity to the next level. Right? <laughs> That's so true. Yeah. That's so true. Yeah. I, I let, since we're still in the past, let's continue our past, uh, a little bit more before we yeah. go to present and the future. So 
knowing that you had your eureka moment all right and then you can use it for yourself but then you decided not only to advance it for yourself but to also help you pull to gain back that creativity and imagination and curiosity what made you know how how did you come up with that passion for yourself well that happened uh as part of my graduate studies so sometimes um one door closes and another door opens up right mm. so uh, when i finished my undergraduate studies i knew i wanted to go on for a phd I thought I was going to go into clinical psychology. I had applied for a doctoral program, and thankfully, I was rejected. <laughs> like, oh, what do I do now? I say, thankfully, I was rejected because I had to step back and say, okay, that didn't work out. Uh -huh. So, what are my other options? What else might I do? And I knew I wanted to go on for continued studies in the field of creativity. So I thought, okay, well that. That PhD in clinical psychology that didn't work out. Well, you know, I'm I'm interested in creativity. Let me do my master's degree then, and then I'll I'll attempt to get into a PhD program after doing a master's degree. So I I chose to do my master of science degree in creativity and change leadership at, at Buffalo State. So um, while I was doing my master's degree. I had the chance to teach and I had never taught before. Oh. Uh, part of the degree was to uh, teach an undergraduate class. So as a graduate student, you taught an undergraduate class. And that I connected to a passion that I didn't even realize I had, right? So mm. uh, this is why it's always important to continue to explore. Um, uh, and try new experiences because we don't know sometimes until we get there that we have a skill at something or we have uh, an interest in something until we we try something new that's why um hello I fell in love with sharing my knowledge with others and seeing other people get turned on by their creativity mm. who were then transformed as a result of uh, the power of teaching. And so it was that experience when something new occurred to me. You know, I thought of psychology as, as you know, counseling and clinical psychology and um, this opened my eyes up to many other fields within psychology organizational psychology in particular and so um, I started to see myself working in the area of organizational psychology and eventually becoming a university professor someone who would be teaching uh, others because um, of you know you asked about uh, a critical moment that experience being in the classroom and and teaching undergraduate students about creativity and seeing them go through the experience I had gone through previously was incredibly rewarding. Wow. So from there, then you start to write in books and start to do the consulting business to have, you know, companies to bring the best creativity out of their employees, right? Mm -hmm. And since when you starting to to have an idea of building the psychological metrics, the foresight, uh, mm -hmm. to help people mm -hmm. to understand themselves, the creativity level within themselves? Yeah, so actually that happened as a result of, as you mentioned, uh, I was as I was moving through graduate school, uh, I started to do some training and consulting with organizations. That's when I became really interested in organizational psychology and thinking, well, how do we help people employees and organizations because organizations they have to solve problems they have to innovate creativity is the fuel to that so how do we help employees within organizations better tap into their creativity and i was doing some training with uh procter and gamble a management training program uh i had taught a creativity tool a decision making tool called the evaluation matrix during the coffee break 
uh, one of the managers came up to me and said, wow, that learning experience we just went through, that evaluation matrix, which is a very rational tool, you use measurement and criteria and rating scales, said, oh my gosh, that was so hard for me. My brain just doesn't think like that to be so objective, to assign numbers to criteria up against choices. And, you know, I just, that, that, that was so challenging for me. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't know I was punishing you. I didn't know I was causing <laughs> you pain. Said, no, 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 no. This is good for me. I'm like, okay. Okay. And then during the same coffee break, literally like a minute later, another manager came up to me, complete opposite reaction. I love that decision making tool. This is, this is how I think very systematically and being really clear in your decision making and weighting your decisions and, and using numbers. I'm like, wow, this is fascinating. I just taught the same tool to a group of 25 people and they were all having different experiences. And what it made me realize was when I'm teaching creative problem solving, it's already inside of people. They only, they already have their own natural way of engaging. It's innate. Mm -hmm. It's innate inside of all people. So as a psychologist, it got me thinking about, well, how can I measure this? Can, can I create a self rating scale? Can I take these stages of the creative process, something that we all probably do naturally. And can I put it into language to have people reflect on it in terms of their lives and how they are naturally. Mm. And so you, know, you, you go out to a restaurant and you look at the menu and you can see how people have different creative problem solving preferences. Like some people will study the menu thoroughly, reading every line, reading all of the ingredients. Some people like me will look, look at it very quickly and within 10 seconds, make a decision, right? So this is naturally inside of all of us. So this measure of foresight puts this creative process into natural language, everyday language to get people to think about like that menu example that I gave you to get people to think about how they are already involved in creative thinking so that it illuminates for them Oh, I'm a clarifier. That's why I don't like to take risks. That's why I like to focus on reality. That's why I like doing research and taking my time. We're ideators. Oh, I like to dream and have a big vision. And I'm always kind of thinking into the future or the developer type person who, oh, I'd like to take one idea and work on it and perfect it and refine it and craft it and and then you have the implementer type person. Again, people are blends of all of these things. It's what we have a stronger preference for. And the implementer person is more of the, uh, let, let me jump into action. Mm. Let, let me, let me move quickly. Um, let me check it off of my to-do list so I can then move on to the next thing. So these personalities, if you will, show up in our lives and impact how we work with other people, including significant people in our lives, our, uh, you know, our loved ones, our friends, our, our teammates. And because one of the things that we do throughout life is we solve problems creatively alone and with others. Mm. And so foresight is a psychological tool that identifies the degree of preference people have for each of these four ways of thinking. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense to me. And I guess, like you say earlier, because, um, you know, life is, is having problem and then like solving problems. Same for companies, right? If they, if we know how to pick a team that can have different kind of creativity, uh, personalities to join in to solve problems that they're facing, then the, the result come out would be a lot better than just randomly pick people onto a team and that might not create the cohesive, you know, between the people uh, for, for problem solving. So how uh, you're exactly you're, I'm sorry. you're exactly right. You're, you're, you're exactly right. And, and one of the things that we know is human nature is such that we when we start to work with people who are different from us, mm. often our inclination is to be judgmental. Mm. Right. Like that person's not like me. That person doesn't think like I do. And sometimes that creates friction or between people 
in teams. And so foresight can help people to recognize the differences and move to a place of appreciation. Like, oh, that's why you're like that. That's, you know, that explains to me how you approach a problem and how differently you approach it than, than I do. Mm. And it moves us from a place of judgment to more effective collaboration. Mm. Uh, I'll, tell, I'll share a story with you. This is more of a personal story. So my partner, Pam, and I, uh, we bought a property and we were refurbishing it to turn it into an Airbnb. I'm more of an implementer type personality, more developer and, and implementer. We call that combination someone who's a finisher. So I like to focus and I'm persistent and I like to get things done. Um, she's the exact opposite. She's more on the front end of the creative process, high clarifier, high ideator. So someone we call an early bird who mm. loves to do research and use that research to come up with possibilities and 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 play with alternatives and we were out at a coffee shop one morning and we've been working on this airbnb refurbishing it for several months and and she started asking questions and started to rethink mm -hmm. um the design that we were playing with at that point we we're starting to look at furniture because most of the you know work on the property in terms of rehabbing it had been done and it was time to think about what's the design of the space going to look like and i thought we had made a decision that we were going with a particular design and she started to ask questions and rethink it and i could feel myself literally i could feel like my blood pressure going up <laughs> like no let's not go backwards we've already made these decisions and of course she was just living out her her own creative process preference she was rethinking and, and coming up with other questions which led to other possibilities and in my mind i thought we had made a decision and committed to this particular design and i had to remember while i was drinking my coffee okay okay this is just part of the creative process this is you know you're reacting you know from an implementer perspective because this is done in your head and you're already moving on to the next thing you know you need to be open-minded here gerard don't be judgmental here pam out and so i have to say just having that recognition mm. refused the situation right instead yeah. of getting into an argument what are you talking about we already made a decision we're going with mid-century modern furniture you know but in order for her to be comfortable she needed to talk it out and to explore other options before settling on that and you know ultimately we did end up going with mid-century modern and it's a very beautiful place um but that's how you know differences in personality can lead to conflict mm. and and having this recognition of this kind of diversity you know because we tend to think about diversity as age and gender and ethnicity and race and culture but their psychological diversity is another form of diversity. Two people can be the same age, same gender, same race, but it doesn't mean they're the same people. Yeah. They can be psychologically very different. And foresight is a tool that helps to reveal that to people, hmm. how we think differently. And how long it, it took you to, uh, to develop foresight and to fully commercialize it? Well, it started back in 88. Um, it didn't get fully commercialized until the late 90s. So, yeah, it took, it took a decade. Oh. And now, um, as I mentioned, it's available in seven different languages. We've had over 200,000 people who have completed it. Um, we know a lot about occupations, for example, and how different profiles, different foresight profiles show up in different occupations and different functional areas within organizations. So engineers are more developer type, IT people are more clarifying, uh, finance more clarifying, marketing more ideating, sales more on the implementer side. And I'm, I'm just giving you the, the highlights here, but that helps to explain, you know, some of the challenges that happen across 
functional errors within organizations because they attract different people. They attract mm. different kinds of thinkers. Mm. And so it helps to reveal uh, how to better collaborate by understanding the mindsets of others, right? Because you don't expect them to conform to you. You have to start to be more flexible as you meet them where they are yeah. and, and, and kind of understand their thought patterns and, and meet their needs and interests. So, yeah. I think that, uh, that personality assessment, the creativity assessment also can apply to, to teenagers for them to identify the career that suits well for them in the future also for them to decide, you know, get what major to go in and, and, and fine tune their career early also, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. There's something in psychology called person job fit. Oh. And when you look at person job fit, there are a couple of things that predict a good fit with a career or with a job. One, of course, is your skills. Do your skills match the demands? Mm. But also what foresight looks at is does your personality match your job? Because it will make certain demands on the kind of thinking that you do. And you know, we, we go to school and we spend all this time learning about other people and facts and content, but we don't spend a lot of time learning about ourselves. Mm. And self-knowledge is so powerful because it helps us to make better decisions about how to direct our lives, to engage in self-leadership and, and so a tool like foresight and many other psychological tools give that insight to you that help you as a person to f make better decisions about what fits in in terms of your own life so yeah i, I agree mm. so if, if a person who listen to this uh, the uh, podcast and would like to take the the foresight assessment how long would it take them to go through the whole assessment itself yeah, so it's only 36 questions. There is a, a self um, a version available. Um, people just need to visit the Foresight website, which is uh, just the spelling F-O-U-R-S-I-G-H-T, Foresight. Um, Foresight op online, foresightonline.com. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, 36 questions it takes 10 minutes. Okay, okay. And then no need for debriefing, just like it was self debrief. Yeah, so the the partnership team at Foresight, I'm not involved in the day to day operations. I'm I continue to be involved in the research, but fantastic team at Foresight's developed a self debrief tutorial that takes you through the results. Uh, personalized Sarah Thurber, um, managing partner, developed a. Um, along with support by the by the team, um, a, a, a personalized, tailored uh, video that walks you through your results and, and your profile. Thank you for doing that because the best way to change is to understand ourselves first, right? So, you know, for us, understand us then, then the change process takes easier. I have two last questions for, for you, Professor uh, Puccio. Okay. And since you're an expert, in in creative thinking my wife and i over the years we've been on the quest to help people to think better because we believe that if they want to change to something better they need to think better and then we have mm -hmm. to believe that you know with so many noises out there these days so our ability to think has been impacted and diminishing over yeah. the years so as an expert we want to ask you yourself your own way of thinking how have you been helping you to grow your ability to think over the years? So I would say two things. That's a great question, very practical question. The first is to learn how to better manage your own judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex Osborne, who was the founder of our department, invented the methodology brainstorming uh, and developed the process, uh, the very uh, teachable, trainable process called creative problem solving. And one of the keys in that is to learn to suspend judgment, mm. learn to defer your judgment, because often because of training, when we come up with an idea, or we start to play with possibilities, the first thing we do is we evaluate it, we judge it. Mm. And that slows thinking down. Um, and so defer your judgment, suspend it, hold it off, explore possibilities, because as soon as you start judging, you narrow your thinking, down to evaluating mm. rather than exploring. So learn to suspend judgment. 
hold off criticism, you know, allow yourself to explore openly. Okay. Number one. Number two, in a chaotic world, um, learn to take a break. Uh, give yourself that the concept is called idea time, time to think. Mm. So take a walk. Um, uh, uh, do engage in some activity that's not highly cognitively demanding because then that promotes mind wandering. You know, go for a bike ride, go for a drive, um, you know, do something that allows your mind to take a break and your brain to wander through memories. And often what this does is it leads to new connections because when we're, you know, in a world that's go, 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 you know, working all the time, we don't allow ourselves, you know, we need this incubation break and great creators, they make it a daily routine um, to uh, go for a walk, exercise, mm. uh, do something physical that's, that's often very useful or engage in a hobby, uh, but something that allows your, your brain time to reflect, that's really important. So I'd say those two things, learn to defer judgment, and then to give yourself idea time. The idea time and defer our judgment. Thank you very yep. much. The last question is about the future. So we traveled the past, we knew, you know, you wanted to become an, a professional athlete, a wrestler, right? And then got into your Eureka movement in 1981, and got into the field of creativity, been in the field since then, with a great passion to help people to get back their creative. You know, and thank you for doing that. So is there anything that you are doing that exciting you want to share with me and the audience so together we can celebrate with you in advance? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, well, that's a great question. So thinking about the future, two things. One, um, we have uh, sent a proposal forward in the State University of New York, which is the uh, second largest university system in, in the U.S., uh, 500,000 students, 64 campuses. Uh, we have proposed a doctoral program in creativity. So one of the few doctoral programs in creativity, but it would be the first that's a doctorate of professional studies. So very much an applied doctorate, not a, not a Ph.D. doctorate of philosophy. It's called the DPS, Doctorate of Professional Studies in Creativity and Change Leadership. So. Uh, think good thoughts, and and um, hopefully this will um, come to fruition. And if so, in a year or two, we will be bringing in a, a class of doctoral students, mid-career professionals who are looking to study at the highest level to earn a doctoral degree from Buffalo State University in creativity and change leadership. Um, so that's that's hugely exciting, and mm. and um, I look forward to. Uh, advancing from master's degree to uh, to a DPS. The other thing that I'm working on is a book contract with Palgrave Macmillan on creativity in higher education. And we're reviewing or, or asking contributors around the world at universities um, that have programs in creativity. And we have found about 50 of them to write chapters on what they do to promote creativity among their students. So. Mm. Uh, what courses they teach, what's their degree program uh, all about, how do they focus on creativity, how do they facilitate creativity among their students. Because the reality is, while the field has grown from one program, our program at Buffalo State, you know, in the mid-1970s, it was the first program of its kind in the world, there are about 50 or so programs now, undergraduate, graduate programs, but there are thousands of universities around the world. In Vietnam, um, you know, I, I don't know of any creativity programs in Vietnam. If any of your listeners know of a university that has a, a program in creativity, would love to have a contributor from a university in Vietnam participate in this book. But the ultimate dream is to make this book inspirational. So university professors and university administrators and university presidents look at this and say, we should have a program like that here. Wow. We need to do that for our students. That's the real aspiration behind this book. It's to celebrate the fact that we have 50 some programs around the world, but 50 
out of thousands of universities is a very small percentage. We want every university to have courses and programs in creativity. So uh, think, think good thoughts about that because we are trying to change the nature of university education to bring more creativity to their students. Wow. Professor Puccio, a, be- a beautiful house doesn't build on, you know, overnight, right? So you said one brick on, on another brick on another brick, and you got, you are doing amazing. Thanks for doing that. And I wish I wish you all the best, all the luck, all the, the support that you will need so that uh, so that you can have the, 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 those dreams come true. And then for the future leaders, if they can be more creatively, then they can solve a lot of problems collaboratively and creatively make it better work for everybody. Thank you for doing that. Well, you're, you're well, thank you. I, I do believe if there was more creativity in the world, we'd have a lot happier, more healthy people. And I do believe we'd have more peace in the world if we used our creative imaginations more so. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for being so generous to join my program and share your story with our audience. I look forward to seeing you in person one day, maybe with Pam, Gabrielle, and Anthony also. That would be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to that. Yes. Um, I, I, I need to, to let you go for other things that are on your to-do list for today. And I really want to say thank you. Thank you so much for such a wonderful opportunity to meet and chat. Well, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you.